Hi, and welcome to the Audrain Automobile Museum and our exhibition, JDM and Beyond, The Worldwide Influence of Japanese Automobiles. In this segment, we'll be taking a look at how Japanese manufacturers got started in the U.S. and how they made their great breakthrough. To do that, we'll be looking at a Subaru 360, a first-generation Honda Civic, and the legendary Datsun 240Z. Let's start with the Subaru 360. This is a 1970 example of the car that was the very first car manufactured by Subaru. It came out in the late 1950s and it was designed, sort of think of it as the Fiat Cinquecento or the Ford Model T of Japan. A car designed to get Japanese off their motorcycles, off of their bicycles and into a car. This car is very small. It's designed to fit into the K, K-E-I, uh, system of Japanese cars which limited by dimensions and the size of the engine were designed to take up less space in cities and also to comply with the very stringent Japanese speed limits. When the K formula was first introduced, cars were limited to 360 cc engines and they could be no longer than 114 inches. Over time that grew to 550 cc engines and then 660 cc engines, which we'll see in a later episode. This car, which was so well adapted to small urban Japanese areas, was also imported into the US. Now, looking at the car, you would think, well, it's sort of Volkswagen Beetle-like. Well, again, it's not really that way. Powered by a two-cylinder engine that put out 25 horsepower, this was a car that was not really designed for American road conditions. The enterprising Malcolm Bricklin, later known for the sports car with the gullwing doors he named after himself, imported these cars and brought 10,000 of them into the US. It took many, many, many years to sell that 10,000, and there's all sorts of stories, most of them probably apocryphal, about cars that were pushed off of docks or buried in landfills. One of the things that was most famous about this car, or perhaps I should say infamous, was the fact that Consumer Reports tested it and rated it not acceptable, something they'd never done for a car before because in their testing, they not only found that it was very low powered and sort of scary to drive on many American roads, but also in certain circumstances, the rear hinged or suicide doors could come open. Now, it's also true that this car was not quite what the American market needed at the time it was introduced. Thinking ahead a few years, during the time of the gas crisis, a car like this that got at least 35 miles to the gallon could have been quite useful in the market, but it was just a little too early for what the U.S. market needed and, frankly, a little crude for most American consumers. It's an interesting point, however, thinking about what this was designed to be and, most importantly, how it proved that Japanese manufacturers were adaptive and could grow and learn from the markets that they entered. We'll see in a future episode here on this exhibition what Subaru later grew to become, and it is miles away from this earnest but ultimately unsuccessful start. The other car I'm with right now is a 1975 Honda Civic. The first generation Civic is a car I remember quite well from my youth, and it really defined for me what small cars were. And the Honda Civic is also remarkable. This example is great because it shows the level of quality that's designed into a very small car, which became a Japanese hallmark. You look in this car, the way it's built, the materials, the wood grain dashboard, the steering wheel, the accessories, the fact that you could get air conditioning and an AM FM radio in a car in this category was remarkable to conceive. And it was also technologically advanced. At a time when US and European manufacturers were struggling to meet new federal emission standards, generally putting uh, air pumps and and had to use a catalytic converter uh, to make their, their cars meet the emissions requirements with this boldly proclaimed CVCC, Compound Vortex Controlled Combustion System, allowed the Honda Civic at this time to not only not have a catalytic converter, but it could also run on regular leaded gas while still meeting the emissions requirements. It was quite an accomplishment, and it really established the base of Honda as a manufacturer to be considered. 
Now, of course, the Honda Civic as a nameplate continues to this day and is now in the 11th generation, and more than 27 million Honda Civics have been sold, which is a remarkable thing. But when you think about also how things grow, we had an exhibition here at the Audrain called Land Yachts, uh, all about big American cars. And when you look at the original Honda Civic and look at a Civic today, the Civic today is the size of the Honda Accord back in the day, actually slightly larger even. And it's remarkable to me, I love small cars and I really admire the ingenuity and imagination that it takes to build a true quality, entertaining small car. And the Honda Civic had it in spades. Now we're going to take a look at a car that thoroughly established once and for all that Japanese manufacturers were not joking around. They knew the market and they knew how to conquer it. Let's take a look at the Datsun 240Z. The Datsun 240Z is seared in the memory of so many enthusiasts around the U.S. and across the world because what Nissan established with this car was truly to become the dominance of the Japanese in this sector. Think about it. In 1970, when this car was introduced, the sports car market was dominated by the British with the greatly aging MG and the greatly aging Triumph, the rather aging Alfa Romeo Spider, and not much else. These cars were rather expensive and very finicky. The Japanese came in with this car, the 240Z, with a very sophisticated specification. A dual overhead cam, 2.4 liter engine, putting out 154 horsepower, gets you from zero to 60 in eight seconds, very respectable for the time, and dead reliable. The cars were beautiful, very well built, and delivered a level of performance that made you think, wow, I don't have to actually buy a Jaguar E-Type or a Corvette. I can buy a Datsun and get the same kind of performance at a lot less money and impress everybody, myself included. These cars are wonderful to drive. They handle beautifully, and they actually are building on the base of a slightly earlier Datsun model, the 510. The 510 took aim at the BMW 1600 with its specification and chassis, and indeed was very successful in SCCA racing, especially with Bob Sharp. And the 240Z continued that uh, tradition with Bob Sharp as well as Brock Racing Enterprises that were extremely successful in SCCA racing. And this is a car that literally made you think you could drive a racing car on the street. The impact these cars had not only on the US market, but also on those manufacturers of the cars I mentioned before, was dramatic. Alfa Romeo had to really step up their game with updating the Spider. It basically put the British sports cars out of business in the US altogether and redefined what people wanted in terms of performance, comfort, quality, and style. The Datsun 240Z went on to become the 260Z and the 280ZX with larger engines, uh, 2 plus 2 was, was uh, introduced, much along the lines of the Jaguar E-Type and the uh, 2 plus 2 that later came. This is a car that means so much to the legacy of Nissan that they've even brought it back in a new version that's a totally different kind of car but still has the same kind of feeling and, and emotion that is evoked by the Datsun 240Z, the original. This is an amazing car and a great example of what this exhibition stands for the JDM influence worldwide on cars. We look forward to welcoming you to our next video here in the gallery, where we'll take a look at another set of cars in this exhibition. Thanks for joining us.